The Cursory presents The Anatomy of Peace by Arbinger Institute. Conflict is everywhere. You'll find it at your workplace, in your home, and even in the broader community you live in. The problem, the authors of the book tell us, is that most of us have no idea what to do about it. For instance, a 2013 study published by Stanford University found that company CEOs feel that improving their conflict management skills was more important than any other skill they could work on. So why is there so much confusion around a topic that has so much need, and where so much good could come to solving it? What this book suggests is that when we are in conflict, we actually value something else much more highly than resolving the conflict. And it's not until we let go of that thing that we'll ultimately start to clean up the conflicts that face us on a regular basis. Join us for the next 12 minutes as we explore this issue, and find a solution that will work if we have the courage to implement it. Note, this book is told in a story form, but we are going to stick to unpacking the main principles. The Influence Pyramid One of the main problems we face in solving conflict is that most people approach it by focusing on things that have gone wrong. Our first instinct when somebody does something we consider wrong is to correct, criticize, or punish them. I'm sure you've tried this enough times in your life to detect a pattern that doesn't work very well most of the time. When we see that it doesn't work, our instinct is to just try the same thing again, but with more intensity. This, of course, only makes matters worse. What we are failing to realize is that instead of focusing on correcting what's wrong, we should be focusing on helping things go right. That's where the idea of the influence pyramid comes in. In getting people to change, if what you are doing isn't working, you move one level down on the pyramid and focus on that. Here are the six levels of the pyramid. 1. Correction. This is the proverbial tip of the iceberg, and rarely works to create change. 2. Teach and communicate. Is what I want clear to the other person. 3. Learn and listen to a person's world. Are the other person's concerns included in my understanding of the issue? 4. Build a relationship. Does the other person like and respect me? 5. Build relationships with others that have an influence on the person. Maybe other people around them have greater influence than you. Build relationships with those people. 6. Get out of the box and obtain a heart of peace. Finally, it's possible that you are not really coming from a place of trying to help, which is causing the other person to be defensive. In this case, you need to learn to approach conflict with a heart at peace. To simplify it, you are much more likely to create change in somebody, if you clearly communicate the change you want to see, have a real relationship with the person, have listened to their needs, and have approached it with the good of the other person first and foremost on your mind. Now let's move our attention to what a heart at peace really looks like. A heart at peace. There are two ways of being in the world that, even if our outward behavior is exactly the same, will ultimately create polar opposite outcomes. It has to do with how we view the other people in our life. A heart of war. A heart of war is where we see people objects. We depersonalize them and reduce them to obstacles to be overcome, a vehicle to be used in the pursuit of your goals, or simply irrelevant. That's not something we like to think of ourselves as doing, but it's a lot easier than you think. For instance, as soon as you put a label on somebody like a category, rich people, foreigners, or role, a customer, a boss. When you do this, those people seem less real to you, and thus it's very easy to view your cares and concerns as much more important than your own. As a result, you will actively resist their humanity. A heart of peace. On the other hand, a heart of peace is where we see people as, well, people. That has hopes and dreams, and fears and concerns, just like we do. This is something that is impossible to do if you have done one of the tricks that the heart of war likes to play. But when we see other people as they truly are, it's much easier to view their cares and concerns on the same level as your own, and ultimately leave you in a place where you can be effective at resolving conflict. Betraying your heart at peace. This is where things start to get interesting. The folks at the Arbinger Institute tell us that human beings naturally have a heart at peace. So whenever we have a heart at war, we are actually betraying our innermost desires, and thus we need to justify that behavior which leads to what they call self-betrayal. When we are in this state, we can never admit that we are the cause of our own problem, and so we go looking outside of ourselves for somebody or something to blame. Which, of course, leads us to view the other people as objects, which only further justifies our heart at war stance. It's an insidious disease, and it distorts our view of reality in every way. Ultimately, the authors tell us, we are choosing to be right rather than being at peace, Illusion. A practical example. When we choose to be right over being at peace, we are simply inviting others to make our lives more miserable. Why? Because we being to provoke in others the very things we profess to hate. The authors call this collusion. Here's how it works in four simple steps. Step number one. I see. This is your perception of others, distorted by your own mental filters. Imagine you come home one day and find your irresponsible children playing on their phones, clearly not doing their homework as they are supposed to. Step number two. I do. This is your behavior, which is distorted by your perceptions. 
You remind them that they should be doing their homework, what will happen if they don't, and how disappointed you are that they continue to make poor choices. Step number three, they see. This is their perception of you and your behavior, which is now further distorted by their filters. Your children see you as a nagging parent, always micromanaging them and expecting them to be perfect. Step number four, they do. This is their behavior that is a reaction to your behavior and their distorted perceptions. Your children disengage and stop completing their homework assignments, because no matter what they do, nothing seems to satisfy you. And from there, the cycle continues, on and on, each of us trapped in a box with the one need that trumps all others. The need to be justified. Their further behavior justifies what we believed all along, and our further behavior justifies what we believed all along. What it takes to break this cycle is to be able to understand the different ways being in the box shows up, so we can step outside it and begin to resolve the conflict, rather than enabling it further. The four ways to be in the box. There are four different ways of being in the box, and each of those four ways causes us to distort our views on four different things. The better than box. 1. You view yourself as superior, important, and right. 2. You view others as inferior, incapable, wrong. 3. You view the world as competitive, troubled, and feel like it needs you. 4. You often feel impatient, disdainful, and indifferent. The I deserve box. 1. You view yourself as a deserving, victim, and unappreciated. 2. You view others as mistaken, mistreating, and ungrateful. 3. You view the world as unfair, unjust, and that it owes you. 4. You often feel entitled, deprived, and resentful. The must be seen as box. 1. You view yourself as somebody who needs to be well thought of, and as a result, fake. 2. You view others as judgmental, threatening, and that they are your audience. 3. You view the world as dangerous, watching you, and constantly judging you. 4. You often feel anxious, needy, and overwhelmed. The worst in box. 1. You view yourself as not as good, deficient, and faded. 2. You view others as advantaged and blessed. 3. You view the world as a hard place, that's always against you, and ignoring you. 4. You often feel helpless, bitter, and depressed. Most people will tend towards one or two of these boxes as a default, but recognize that depending on the circumstances you find yourself in and the people you are surrounded by, you might find yourself using any of them, or none of them. Getting and staying out of the box. Now that you know what being in the box looks like it's time to figure out how to get out of it, so you can live your life with a heart of peace. Getting out of the box. Getting out of the box requires you to do three things. First, be on the lookout for signs of being in the box. One way to do this is to identify a person who you are likely to be out of the box most of the time. Then, compare how you are feeling in the current situation to how you usually feel with that person. Second, find what the authors call an out-of-the-box space. This could be surrounding yourself with people you can be out of the box with easily, thinking about previous situations you have been out of the box with the person you are interacting with right now, or spending regular time in places where being out of the box comes naturally to you. And third, ponder the situation you find yourself in right now in a new way. Ask yourself the following questions. 1. What are this person's or people's challenges, trials, burdens, and pains? 2. How am I, or some group of which I am a part, adding to these challenges, trials, burdens, and pains? 3. In what other ways have I or my group neglected or mistreated this person or group? 4. In what ways are my better than, I deserve, worse than, and must be seen as boxes obscuring the truth about others and myself, and interfering with potential solutions? 5. What am I feeling I should do for this person or group? What could I do to help? Staying out of the box. Getting out of the box momentarily is one thing, staying out of it is another thing altogether. The key to doing this, the authors tell us, is to start doing what we feel we need to begin doing for the people we are now truly seeing. Conclusion. Resolving conflict is hard, mostly because we decide to make it much harder than it needs to be. In order to make it easier on yourself, remember the following three lessons. 1. Most of your time and effort should be spent at the lower levels of the pyramid. 2. The solution to a problem at one level of the pyramid is always below that level of the pyramid. 3. Ultimately, your effectiveness at each level of the pyramid depends on the deepest level of the pyramid, your way of being.